Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? We've had our coffee, our Red Bull. Are we good to go? Good, because I figured since we are on a college campus, let's start off with a pop quiz. Okay, we all love those in college, right? Okay, I'm gonna ask five questions and you don't have to say yes or no. Just think about how you might answer in your head. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that as I get further into the presentation. So, first question. Do you feel your work must be 100% perfect 100% of the time? Or do you work harder at work because you feel you always need to prove your worth? Do you avoid challenges because it's uncomfortable to, to do something that you don't really know how to do very well? Do you do everything on your own without ever asking for help, even though you might need it? And finally, if you've ever been, or if you've been in your role for a while, do you still feel like you don't know enough? Okay, so if you answered yes to one or maybe all of these questions, you may have imposter syndrome. And Dr. Valerie Young in her book, The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, she identified five different types of imposters. So if you answered yes to the first one, you're probably a perfectionist and you set very high goals for yourself and if you want something done right, you just feel like you have to do it yourself. Or if you answered yes to the second one, you're the superwoman imposter. And you push yourselves to work harder because you feel like you always need to prove your worth at work. But this might be a false cover up for insecurities that you may have. If you answered yes to three, and that's me, I always answer yes to this one, like speaking in front of an audience. Um, you, you judge your competence on, based on how fast you can do something, how easily you pick it up. And if you don't pick up things very easily, you think it's something wrong with you. If you answered yes to the fourth one, you might feel phony asking for help. I think you may say, if you ask for help, you might think that person thinks you don't know what you're talking about. Or why did we hire this person? She doesn't know anything. And finally, if you answered or yes to number five, you base your competence on what you know. And a lot of times these people are knowledge hoarders. So they wanna keep all the knowledge to themselves because they think that gives them value. And they fear, fear being exposed as inexperienced or unknowledgeable. So the good thing is, well, let's talk about the definition first. So she read a definition to you. There's probably like 30 definitions out there, but really it's imposter syndrome is about high achieving individuals. They can be men and they can be women. W women are mostly talked about in the research, but men do, do have this as well. And their fear of being found out or unable to recognize their accomplishments. It's an individual's internal belief that they are incompetent and even a fraud. And it's this persistent inability to believe one's success is achieved or earned. Now we all go into situations like, let's say it's your first day in a new position. Of course you're gonna feel scared, right? Because you don't know what you're doing. But it's different with imposter syndrome because these people always feel it. No matter what level of success they've achieved, they always feel like they're a fraud and that they're going to get found out. So I have good news. If you answered yes to any of those questions, you're in very good company. Oh, this is basically it sum, summed up. This is how you feel. So you're in very good company. Maya Angelou, one of America's most renowned writers, she had imposter syndrome. She said, I've written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're gonna find me out. I've run a game on everybody and they're going to find me out or Oscar-winning actress Kate Winslet. If you've won an Oscar, you think, gosh, you know what you're doing, right? No, she woke up in the morning before going off to a shoot and she always thinks, I can't do this, I'm a fraud. Michelle Obama, she has an impressive resume, both educationally and career-wise. She has imposter syndrome. She said, I still have a little bit of imposter syndrome. It doesn't go away, that feeling that you shouldn't take me seriously. What do I know? If Michelle Obama's asking that, <laughs> you're in good company, right? <laughs> and finally, like I said, it's not just women, it's also men. So can anybody figure out or tell me who they think may have said this particular term? 
The exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Anyone want to take a guess? Now it's your pop quiz. <laughs> Albert Einstein, one of the greatest minds that's ever lived on this earth. He suffered from imposter syndrome. And I thought I would be totally transparent with you. I consider myself an expert on imposter syndrome because I've been living with it for so long. And I put a picture of me in high school because I feel like that's when it started to hit for me. And the height of my bangs directly correlates <laughs> to how many years I've been dealing with imposter syndrome. Spoiler alert, it's over 30. <laughs> and I also wanted to put a picture of me. This is uh, the Dean of, of the College of Education, Dean Lee, and me, and I'm holding an award. I had won the Rising Star Award for the College of Education. And what that means is, out of all the doctoral students in the College of Education, I was picked as the top one. Right, that's great, right? And I have a smile on my face, and I'm holding this award. But I can tell you that the things that were going through my mind as I was holding this award were things like, well, nobody else must have been nominated. <laughs> or I know a lot of people in the College of Education, I know a lot of professors, they just like me. Maybe that's why they picked me. Things of that nature, I couldn't accept that I had won this award, and I earned it. I was working full time, I was going to school to, in my doc program, I, was, I had to buy a house and sell a house, I was potty training, my toddler, not me. <laughs> I was doing all these things and I still ended up winning an award and I couldn't celebrate it. I just felt like, they're gonna find me out. They're gonna know that I have no idea what I'm talking about. So, where does it stem from? Well, there's a number of different reasons why people might have imposter syndrome. It could be personal, familial, social experiences that you've had, maybe experiences in academia, or maybe you don't fit the, what is considered the norm. Maybe your culture is different. Maybe you're the first or the only one. So for instance, in my career, there's lots of times that I've been the only woman of color in the room. And there's times when I've been in companies where I'm the only person of color. And that puts a lot of pressure on people, right? So that sort of fosters an environment of imposter syndrome. So what are its characteristics? Well, you attribute your accomplishments to good timing or luck. Oh, I was just in the right place at the right time, right? Oh, I was just lucky. You're convinced you don't deserve the, the success you've achieved. And this manifests as feelings of self-doubt and fears of failure, and more importantly, fears of actually succeeding. Oh no, what happens then? And this, you know, this, like I said, it, it does um, occur in women a lot, lo a, a lot more, and um, I also think women just talk about it more than men do. But KPMG did a survey of executive women and they found that 81% of executive women believe they put way more pressure on themselves not to fail than men. And women are significantly less likely to self-promote for fear of repercussions. And the research shows that women can be penalized for exercising power. But the opposite for men, they're celebrated for it. And women displaying confident behavior are often labeled bossy, or the other B word, <laughs> or abrasive. And they did research and they, they looked at um, men, men's performance reviews and women's performance reviews. And they found the word abrasive in the women's performance reviews much more than men. Actually, it was never found in a male performance review in that study. So as a woman entrepreneur, as a woman at work, you're placed under a microscope that's much more fierce than a man. And the language used about women who are powerful or confident is often derogatory. So I wanted to give you a case study. Two people here, I think you know who they might be, on complete opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they both were running for president. And when you run for president, you're essentially asking the American people to give you power, right? So, Bernie, everybody loves Bernie. You might not agree with his, his politics, but he had a meme, that meme with the code, and <laughs> he just bucks the traditional notion of a, a presidential candidate. He doesn't care what he looks like. 
Obviously, look at his hair in that picture, <laughs> right? And here's the other one, who obviously doesn't care what he looks like. He's a crazy comb over and a spray tan. But people who like Donald Trump really like him. And the things that they say about him are, he's powerful, he's decisive, he shows emotion, but he shows anger. So what do these two gentlemen have in common? They're both praised for an image that no female candidate would ever be allowed to have, right? And if you don't believe me, Hillary Clinton. Regardless of how you might feel about Hillary Clinton, she is a woman who was asking for power. And she was required to prove her competence over and over again. And if she de deviated from perfection, oh, you're gonna hear about it. If she showed up looking like Bernie Sanders, what do you think the, the headlines would be? That's all they would focus on. And as a matter of fact, Media Matters looked at all the different articles about her in the 2007-2008 campaign. And they found 14 different categories of sexism, not 14 instances, 14 categories, such as her appearance. No Americans want to watch a woman get older before your eyes, ew. Or her femininity. Oh, you mean besides the PMS and the mood swings? Would they ever say that about a male candidate? No. They attacked her, she couldn't talk. She needs a shot collar because she get, starts to get screechy. Or if she shows emotion, she's Sybil. Or her success was due entirely to her husband. They would never say that about a male candidate, would they? And you hope, this is like 2007 and 2008, you would hope that as time goes on, these things would get better, right? No. This is a headline from exactly one week ago. It says, does she think this is a rodeo? Kirsten Cinema is eviscerated online for wearing a denim vest and sneakers to preside over the Senate. How dare she? She wore jeans. Everybody knows you can't lead when you're wearing jeans. So, a lot of this has to do, um, I feel like imposter syndrome is very systemic. It's not just the person. It's in a lot of the um, organizations and institutions um, around America and around the world. And I think it starts in childhood because boys are raised to be leaders. They're raised to take risks. It's okay if they fail. They're raised to be confident and less emotive. But girls are raised to get the right answer to be good. And I know things are changing, right? But it's still an issue. And being good doesn't really prepare women for the workplace. Once men and women get into the workplace, then imposter syndrome can really start to flourish in women. So with men, they're rewarded for confidence, even if they're incompetent. And people often, the research shows people mistake Confidence for competence. I'm sure you all know a leader that is um, leading and you might not think they're the smartest person, but because they're so confident, everybody just listens to them and believes it. But women who are confident and assertive get punished for it. And the way that men and women look at success is very interesting. And again, this isn't all women and this isn't all men, and I don't want to pick on the males <laughs> in the room, but it's enough where it's an issue. So when men succeed, it's because of something they did. It's internalized. Oh, I won that pitch. Oh, I got that client. When women succeed, they tend to say, oh, well, it's because I had a really good team around me, right? Or I was just in the right place at the right time. Back to that. However, when they fail, men will blame everybody else, right? <laughs> it's that person's fault I didn't get this. It's that person's fault that we didn't do this. But when women fail, they really internalize it. Oh, it's something that I did. It's, or it's because of a lack of effort or whatever it is. And so that leads to entitlement syndrome in men and imposter syndrome in women. And again, not all men and not all women, but enough. So I wanna talk a little bit about entitlement syndrome. 
And when you're a male, you're kind of just expected to succeed. Nobody really seems to question if you've gotten a position, no one says, oh, I wonder how he got that. You kind of just expect it. And even if that person's incompetent, they don't question it because everybody else thinks they're competent, right? They believe it. Their competence, incompetence is rarely questioned. And when there are people of color or women and they don't succeed, men with entitlement syndrome will think, well, it's something that they have to deal with. It's their fault. They need to figure it out. But this is really more systemic. And I like what Kegler said. She said, entitlement syndrome thought patterns are allowed to exist invisibly as the status quo to which other groups must conform in order to be successful. Now what she's really saying is, if you don't meet that traditional notion of a leader or tra traditional notions of, of the workplace, then you have to conform. You have to change. But it shouldn't be that way. And when I was preparing this presentation, what we were supposed to do this like a year or two ago, right? In the time since then, an article came out that was really interesting, and it's by Rashika Tulshian and Jody Ann Burry. And it came out in the Harvard Business Review in 2020. And what they say is, stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. It's not women. It's the systems that are, that are sort of fostering this. And women have, especially women of color, they're saying they don't have imposter syndrome. They're just repeatedly facing systemic bias and racism in workplace. And so then they feel like they don't belong because they really weren't made to belong in these spaces. And I don't know, how many of you know Brene Brown? Have you heard of her? So she has a podcast. And Jody Ann and Rashika were on this podcast about three weeks ago talking about their article. And one of the things that they mentioned was this pet to threat syndrome that women of color often face. Where, you know, a company will hire you and they're like, they're so excited. Oh, we're so excited to bring your diverse viewpoint to our company. And we want to hear what you have to say until they actually say things. And Jodi Ann said, I was working for a company. They told me I was, I was so, that they were so excited to have me there. But then I started asking questions in meetings, some hard questions. And then it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She was told, can you just tone it down a little bit? Or maybe just don't ask so many questions. You're making the, the leaders feel kind of bad. And so she goes, to, she goes into threat, so pet to threat. So I agree with Rashika and Jody Ann. This is a systemic issue. However, what do you do when the systems don't change in fast enough for you and you're still dealing with imposter syndrome? So I think that it should be that we should look at it both systemically and individually. So what are the implications of imposter syndrome? Well, imposter syndrome leads to setbacks in careers. A lot of times women with imposter syndrome, they're too paralyzed to speak up at meetings. They're afraid of the backlash or what people might say to them, so they don't. And they're not asking for the opportunities because they feel like they're not qualified. And imposter syndrome stops women from putting themselves forward for promotions. In that KPMG report in 2020, they found that 45% of executive women did not seek promotions they know they deserved. So what does that lead to? That leads to less capable women moving up the ladder and other people going in in place of them. It also prevents women from asking for raises that we deserve. I don't know if anybody's kind of felt weird when you're working, you're trying, you want to ask for a raise, but you feel kind of afraid about it, and so then you don't. 63% of, of executive women did not ask for a pay raise. And what's even more interesting or frightening to me is that they found when a woman is happy at her job but wants a pay raise, they're more likely to quit their job 
and go somewhere else to get that pay raise rather than just asking for it. So what, is, what are the implications of that? Well, businesses, it's costing them a lot of money because if you have a very capable employee who goes somewhere else, what do you have to do? You have to spend money to find somebody to replace that person. And you have to spend money to train that person. When you could have had the person with all the organizational knowledge there, you could have just paid them more. But you didn't because they didn't ask. And this is happening over and over again. So it's, it's frightening. And in terms of costing businesses millions of dollars, then that leads to reduced productivity, right? Retention issues and gender pay gap issues. So it needs to be addressed, again, both systematically and individually. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the systems first, and then I'm going to go into maybe how we can help to manage it ourselves. So tips for leaders if, or uh, owners of companies or organizations, be supportive. If you're a person that's a leader, serve as a mentor to the people that are coming up behind you and talk to them about their strengths and their weaknesses. Because a lot of times, especially if people have imposter syndrome, they can't see their strengths. They need to hear it from somebody else and they don't even know sometimes what their strengths are. But when you hear it from somebody else, that gives you confidence and it makes you wanna take some risks. And I think the most important thing that leaders should do is tell their employees that it's okay to fail. That's how you learn, right? You want people to take risks because risks lead to innovation. Promote inclusion and diversity is my next tip. People talk about equity and inclusion all the time, but do they really mean it? Or is it something just to check the box? And if you're a woman of color like me and you're going into an organization, I don't know if I feel like I can be my authentic self because it doesn't fit the traditional notions. However, if I go into an organization where I feel that the culture welcomes my diverse thought, then I'll be more apt to give my thoughts and to speak up. Also, promoting a collaborative culture. When you have a collaborative culture, you feel that you can take more risks and you feel like you can be yourself and ask those questions and you're working together. Research shows diverse teams are way more productive and much more innovative than a team that's all the same type of person. Now, tips for just you if you're not a leader, but if you're in the workplace. If you see <coughs> something, things happening like people speaking out against a woman who's a leader and saying things like abrasive, bossy, say something. Don't let, it, don't let it keep happening in your workplaces. And in those evaluations, if you see that word abrasive, explain to somebody why that word is very problematic. But I think the second scenario is something that we may have all dealt with. Where you're in a meeting and you have all these people around the table and you say something, you say a really good idea, and, and nobody seems to acknowledge it. But five minutes later, somebody else, usually a male who has a louder voice, says the same exact thing, and everybody's like, oh, that's such a great idea, Tim, yeah, great. Has that happened to anybody in here, or have you seen it happen? Yeah, right? So when that happens, interrupt. Say, oh, Jim, um, Tamara just said that. Tamara, can you talk more about your great idea? Because the person that said the idea is not, is more likely to not say anything and sit and stew instead of saying, what am I chop liver? I just said this five minutes ago, or did you guys not hear it? And it makes them look angry. If you say something when you see it, you don't know how much of a help you'll be to that person, especially if they're struggling with imposter syndrome. And finally, tips for you and me, because I'm still dealing with this. 
So I have some bad news. You're probably never going to get over imposter syndrome. So the title of my presentation, I lied. <laughs> I said how to over, but the good news is you can change your relationship with it. You can manage it. It doesn't have to paralyze you. So one of the things that they say is when you hear that voice telling you, I don't know what I'm talking about. These people think I'm stupid. They're going to fire me. I'm a fraud. Name that voice and separate it from yourself. Don't let it become your inner truth. I take it a step further and I say, name the voice someone you don't like. Maybe an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and when that voice is saying, you don't know what you're talking about, be quiet, you're a fraud, say, step off, Tim, cool it, zip it, I don't wanna hear it. And it sounds crazy, but it works. Because you don't want those voices to become, again, your voice of inner truth. Your voice of inner truth should be celebrating you. Develop a team of mentors. This doesn't even have to be people in your industry. It can be your friends. It can be family members. But develop a team around you that will encourage you, encourage you to take risks, give you constructive criticism that you'll take. That's how you learn and grow. Call, and I call them, you know, have your own cheerleading squad that can help you because you're going to be a lot more confident when you have people around you that support you. Face insecurities head on. So when you get a challenge for a project or maybe they ask you to speak to a conference of women and you don't want to do it, <laughs> my advice to you is if it scares you, say yes. Do it. I don't care if you don't know how to do it. Do it because the more that you do things that you're not comfortable with the better you're going to get at it and the more confidence you have it's those little wins that will help you oh well i you know i gave that presentation now i can go give another one and participate in meetings i am so guilty of not saying anything and I, we were just talking earlier about your strengths one of my strengths is input and so when I'm around a table, I just like listening and observing. And I need to have all the information before I either make a decision or before I say something. But I had a mentor say to me, Lisa, I know you have good ideas in there, but you're not saying them. You need to speak up. And I'm thinking, well, first of all, I don't want to speak up because they're going to find out I'm a fraud and I don't know what I'm talking about. But I felt insecure about it. But I had those good ideas. And also own your success. Write down, when you get a win, write it down. Keep a diary of it. And I think one thing that you might, you might do is look at your resume because your resume is basically all the great things about you, right, in your career. Because you're trying to sell yourself to an organization or a company. Go back and look at it. Reflect on it. I did that. I increased sales 187%. Nobody else did it, you did it. So own your success. And don't downplay your achievements like me. When somebody gives you a compliment on your work, say thank you. Don't say, well, I was just, you know, I was just lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. No, they're complimenting you because you did a great job. Now, back to this. Did anybody say yes to any of these? Just out of care, okay. So if you answered yes, you're the perfectionist imposter, learn to take your mistakes in stride. It's okay to fail. That's how you grow and that's how you learn. View them as a natural part of the process. I know I was like, I don't like to, I don't like to fail, I hate it. It makes me itch. But that's the only way that you grow. So you have to be comfortable with, with making those mistakes. Or if you're the superwoman imposter, train yourself to not seek that, always seeking that external validation. You're not always gonna get validated from work. You have your friends and family for that. And learn to take constructive criticism, constructive criticism, because again, that's how you grow. 
If you're a natural genius, don't think of yourself as not being able to, just think of yourself more as a work in progress. Okay, I don't know how to do this, but I'm gonna start taking steps to learn. And keep taking those steps until you become an expert in it. If you're the soloist, ask for help, it's okay. You may save yourself hours, day, weeks of work because somebody has the answer that you need. You just have to ask. And when somebody asks you a question, do you think, oh my God, that person's an idiot? Well, maybe sometimes you do, but <laughs> most of the time you're just like, oh, you're happy to answer. And you know what? People love to talk and they love to feel like they're the expert on something. So if you ask questions, they're gonna love it because it gives them a chance to show off <laughs> and show that they're the expert. If you're the expert and you're hoarding that knowledge, don't hoard it, share it. Mentor your junior colleagues. The more that you talk about what you know, you're gonna become more confident because you're like, you know, I know this, I'm an expert in this. And you're gonna feel more confident. And finally, I wanna end with a couple of different quotes that I think are um, that reflect this presentation. Michelle Obama said, I have probably been at every powerful table you can think of. I've worked at nonprofits, I worked at foundations, I worked at corporations, I've served on corporate boards, I have been at G summits, I have sat in at the UN. She has been in some very powerful rooms, right? And what does she say? The people in those rooms, they're not that smart. <laughs> so don't feel that you're not smart enough to be in the room. And don't feel that you're not smart enough to be at the table, because you are. You got there, right? And I don't know if any of you know Lovey Ad Ajayi Jones. She's hilarious. She's written books on imposter syndrome. And she talks about that. She talks about she's getting asked to be in these very powerful rooms with very powerful people. And she says, you know, I've ended up in those spaces with people like Oprah that I admire. And each time I question how I ended up there, every single time. So she's facing imposter syndrome. But she says, after I reflect, I go back to, I worked hard for this. I don't have to be the best. I'm enough. And since I'm here in that room at that powerful table, it's no accident. I walk away knowing that I need to keep doing what got me in that room and I need to keep doing it well. So again, don't be intimidated by the rooms that you're invited in and at the tables that, you're, that you sit at. They're not that smart. You're probably smarter and you belong there. You're there for a reason. And finally, I wanna end with this quote by Dangerous Woman on Twitter. Whatever you think you can do, just know that there's someone out there confidently doing it wrong <laughs> right this minute. And they have no plans at doing it better either. And people are paying them to do it. So please believe in your own excellence as much as they believe in their mediocrity. Believe in your own excellence. And that's my presentation. I hope you liked it. If you want to talk about imposter syndrome, if you have any questions, hey, I've been living with it so I can help, <laughs> feel free to reach out. And I was, it's just so exciting for me to be here. You know, when I, when I promoted the, um, what I was going to be talking about on social media, I can't tell you how many women private messaged me and said, um, yeah, I need to talk to you about this. <laughs> I think I have that. I mean, there's probably like 10. <laughs> so this is an issue, but we can get through it together. And it always helps to talk to people who've been going through it. Um, so I'm gonna open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, one of the things that a friend of mine who was in a law firm said they had received some training on, the women in the law firm was like, similar to the example you shared with sort of interrupting and saying like, that was Lisa's, yeah, yeah, that's just like what Lisa said. And it was something around echoing, like sort of, and I, I didn't get the, I don't know if anyone has <laughs> like been trained in this because I only got it secondhand. Yeah. It was something about like, 
if you said something in a meeting, then I would, even if it wasn't like someone taking over the point, then I would say, well, is Lisa just, and then you sort of echo yep. their opinion? Is that a technique? Is yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, if you're the person that said it, you're probably, well, I won't say it. You're probably not going to be the one to be like, hey. No, of course, right. So, again, so if somebody else says, hey, what echoes what they just said, not in a taking credit for it sort of way, yeah. then that's a good thing, right? Yeah. I think. Yes. So do you see, so is this part of your study for your master's or? No. Actually, well, my doctorate, I'm studying um, I'm studying higher ed leadership and I'm looking at um, Latino women in community colleges, but I have written um, articles on gender bias language in community college presidential job op like applications or uh, advertisements. And what we found was that when, um, when they're talking about the job, if they use a lot of typically masculine words like we're seeking a powerful leader that women will say no that I it's the language is too strong and so we we recommended that you use more um, gender neutral language in those descriptions and the other thing I wanted to mention um, when men and women are applying for jobs research shows that if men hit maybe 50 ish 60 percent of the requirements oh they'll apply but women ha think they have to meet 100%. And if they don't, they won't apply. So what does that mean? There are people taking those jobs that some very capable women should be applying for. Those are just suggestions. You don't have to fit everything. Or maybe something in your experience and your past fits. How, but how are you going to know if you don't apply? So did you have something else to say about that? or? Oh yeah. The mm -hmm. And so that becomes that person mm -hmm. who doesn't speak up and who doesn't stand up for yep. themselves. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I was bullied. I know that that played into it. Um, I grew up in Portage at a time where there weren't hardly any other Latino people there, like late seventies. I was really the only Mexican American at my school. And I've, it's like I've always been in those situations. So it's uncomfortable and you always feel like, well, I don't look like everybody else. I don't come from the same background. And it's hard to get over. It really is. You have to work at it. Yes. No, that's it's so, right. And it's the truth. Yeah. I think like sometimes in these settings, we talk about the fact that we have imposter syndrome as women in, in these spaces, but then we don't say anything about the mold to look for. Because I also don't want to be the men in power there, right? That that is not how I work. It's not where my right comes from, right? So it's like we don't often have the conversations of like you know I liked your questions about like redirecting, you know, or echoing back someone's statement to them, redirecting. It's like us finding ways to sort of jump in. Yeah. There isn't a mold I want to look up to or follow. It's <laughs> about believing in you, right? Yes, yes. That you. So that's been like an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Here, you give the presentation because, like, <laughs> I love, I love everything that you're saying. That's so great, you know? Because you're right. You don't always want to be the leader, like, and and it is sometimes a result of your team. But I think women are just, they're, and, and again, not all women. And things are changing. And again, when I talked about childhood, things are changing. It's not. All, it's not go, it's not so like boys are this but we still haven't gotten there yet and so you may not want to be the leader and it's okay to to you should be thanking your team but everybody should do that and not everybody does I know Tamara you had an experience um, on your call when you were talking about how I think um, there was a woman that they were talking about I think that she had a um, I'm trying to think of what it was 
Like there were males that were talking and you kind of called them out on this phone call because they were talking about a woman that was a leader in one of your organizations or something. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry, Tamara. <laughs> but I thought it was a great example <laughs> because you called it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You know, I would not underestimate the male mentoring. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I, so if you flip that, I think in a positive direction, I think strengthening the female mentoring um, process at yes. work is really important and maybe a way to move forward. And I say that because, um, you know, I can't tell you how many, uh, having a long career now, uh, <laughs> Left it off. You know, yep. I mean, and I think, you know, it's that personal connection and being able to have that uh, that colleague who's going to be your mentor yeah. and who's going to block for you. Yes. Uh, so Very important. Exactly. So I think, you know, again, so if you say, well, that's, I don't even see it as a negative because I think that is a, that's a positive mentoring system. Yes, I agree. You just need to strengthen it for the females. Yes. And the research shows they did a, a, a study on women of color um, uh, that were high up in, a, in academia, and they found that it didn't matter if their mentor was the same color as them, a different color, it didn't matter about gender, as long as they had a mentor. So, and a lot of them said that male mentors actually help, help seem to help them more just because, you know, what position they may have had. But it really doesn't matter, just get somebody that can speak into your life and talk to you about how to navigate certain ways and, and talk to you about your strengths and talk to you about your weaknesses and what you can be doing better, because all of that helps. Yeah. And also talk to leadership. Yeah, be that buffer. Yeah, a little buffer there, you know, and so now that you mentioned down. Yeah, upward, yep, that's a great point. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are buying for the same position, and so instead of I got your back and I'm here to support you, I'm doing things that are going to hurt you. What did your study show about that? I, you know what, I haven't really read anything about that, but I will tell you that I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. So I know it happens, and it's, it's, it's really disappointing because it's like as women, and we should all be trying to lift each other up, but in some cases that doesn't always happen. But that's a good point, and I'm now I'm going to look for it. <laughs> I'm going to go find some studies that talk about that because that's really interesting. Yes. I feel like I have a question for like all of us because it really it kind of spans some generations, and it's interesting yep. to me, right? Like from my point of view, like I hear a lot of great points. I hear some of them that sound like we're trying to solve within the problematic framework of like talk to leadership. Like this generation, we're like, no, we're coming for leadership. <laughs> yeah. Like we're coming to become leadership. So what is it? What's interesting is it's going to be messy. Right? Mm -hmm. We're in transition right now, and it is messy, and it's like an interesting space to discuss like what that feels like or what we do, right? Because it's, yes. it is happening. Yes. It is changing. So some of these things still do work. We still do have to find a male mentor that's going to buy for us. I'm kind of like, fuck that. <laughs> 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 but I yeah. It's, I'm yeah. Like, I don't disclaim. Like, I see why it matters. Yeah. And that's why it's like that article by Jody Ambury and Rashika Tulsha. It's like that blew my mind because it's like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's the systems that need to change. But again, are the systems going to change in time? I mean, it's good that they are changing, but for me, like I'm almost 50 years old. Like I, it's not changing in time for me. So I, I really need to, to work on it, but I want to make it my mission to wherever I'm at to start enacting change and disrupting those systems. Well, I was going to say, you know, you're talking about like the systemic change and the individual change, but I think that's part of the individual change is where can yes. we insert ourselves yes. to make the systemic change. So, like when you were saying, you know, I don't want to be that type of leader. Well, but we still want to be leaders. We just right. want it to be a little more collaborative. We want it to be a little yeah. more, right, like empathetic and, and hearing each other and more inclusive. Mm -hmm. 
but like I think that is the individual work is yes be, where can we insert ourselves can, you all could have given this presentation <laughs> that was so yeah you guys are making such great points I love it yes I want to add, add something to the conversation regarding mentorship only because this was a study that came out from um, Bank of America very recently I'm an employee of Bank of America uh-huh and I'm a little embarrassed because I'm going to share that I didn't read it well enough to deliver the punchline. Okay. <laughs> what I did read was very important. And what their studies show, and Bank of America has this fantastic mentorship program that they're always advertising to women. Now here I'm going to say I've never signed up. And that's the point of the study that Bank of America came to, <laughs> and that is, and by the way, I'm a 31-year veteran of Merrill Lynch Bank of America. So I've never signed up for um, mentorship to provide or to get. The point of the study was that we're not reaching the people who would benefit most from mentoring. Mm. And that struck a chord with me because I've never signed up. Here's why. It wasn't because I didn't think I had something to offer. I couldn't be bothered. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. I wish I remembered the point. Sorry. No, no, but the, you made a great point. And especially now in the pandemic, all of us at our organizations, a lot of these organizations are like morale is low and people are getting laid off and people are getting let go. And so then the people there have to take on more work and you don't have time for another thing, right? You're so busy doing the work of three other people, you don't have time to do it. But this is important work, and it really, you know, it's like if we don't do it, we, no one's going to do it. You, we just have to. And I'm so um, encouraged by the generations that are coming up behind me. You know, I'm Gen X, and you know, the millennials, the Gen Z, like they're bringing, like you said, you're coming for leadership, and that's a good thing. It's time. It really is. It's time. We can't go on the way we have been going on. We have to change. much younger person who came up with this strategy and she talked about it on Twitter, she told herself that she was gonna get like 50 no's or 100 no's um, for jobs that she was applying for. And so that made her apply for jobs that she wasn't fully qualified for because she was like, you know, ones that interested her but that she wasn't fully qualified for. And so she thought she was trying to get all these no's to kind of fulfill her quota that was just a <laughs> for Yeah. Job. What she found was that she actually got a lot more classes than she wow. expected to come in an interview, or in some cases they said, well, you know, actually you're not a good fit for this position, but we have some another need wow. that we, you know, hadn't advertised or hadn't put out there, and you seem really qualified for that. And so I like that <laughs> yes. because it's sort of like, what's the harm if you're applying for jobs And so many of our students right now, you know, you apply through a website, you don't even get to talk yeah. to a person. And so you know, getting 50 no's or 100 no's, that might be kind of put it in a more fun context and you might be really surprised in the outcome. I love it. Yeah. Apply for the, it's so funny. This just happened yesterday. My, my husband sent me a, a job um, description because he's looking for jobs and he said, oh, I think I, this would be fun. And I looked at the job description. It's like, you can't do like any of this. <laughs> like very smart guy, very capable, very innovative, very creative. But the job, I was looking at like, are we reading the same job description? And of course, that's me thinking, oh, I'd never apply for that if I were you. And he's thinking, let's apply for it. And that was yesterday. I was just like, oh my gosh, this fits into my presentation. But apply for those jobs because you don't know. It might not be that job, but hey, it might be a, a better job. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great point. I love it. I'm going to take that to heart. <laughs> Any other questions or feedback? I hope you had fun. I hope I was engaging. I hope I woke you up. Uh -huh. And I hope you have a good rest of your conference. Thank you so much. <laughs>